some of you remember this uh, phrase years ago. We would often, uh, Sunday school, talk about joy, right? J-O-Y. It was a Sunday. Who remembers the Sunday school lesson on joy? Jesus, others, and you, right? The Sunday school lesson. Joy is very simple. Jesus, others, and you. In my experience, living daily joy is not so simple. It's a little bit harder. We love our Sunday school lessons, and when we have those beautiful classes and Lord resurrect our children's ministry and Lord touch the children of this region, but the truth is that the Bible lessons in Sunday school are easy, but the questions of life are often really hard. And so how do we live sustained, ongoing joy that doesn't just last for a Sunday school class or for a cute little phrase, but actually sustains over time? And we're doing a series on the fruit of the Spirit, and it just so happens that joy is the next one. So we're focusing on what this is and how we get it. How do we have sustained joy in our life? And this is something that, that really, I think, is central to the Christian life because we know, we know that we should be elated with these verses. We know that as we read those Psalms, that cheers us up for the moment. But then the rain comes, and then the trials come, and then real life comes, and how do we sustain that in the midst of all that? So we love the Word of God here, and so the Word of God has some clues of how we can sustain that joy. So our scripture reading for today is from Galatians, and what we're doing is we're working through chapter 5, which is the context of the fruit of the Spirit, and then we are focusing once again on each of the fruits. So let's read Galatians 5. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. You're going to find out how this relates to our joy sermon. How could this passage relate to our joy sermon? We're going to weave it in. The fruit of the Spirit. Say it with me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Sustaining joy through life. The very first thing. We need to have God's valuation of our life. We need to understand God's valuation. God values things different than we do. God values us different. God values the things that we worry about different. God values so many things different. We need to understand God's valuation. As we look to Psalm 51, and we're going to spend a lot of time in this series in Psalm 51, we know this was about David's brokenness, and we all experience brokenness. The exact reason of our brokenness or the exact particulars of our brokenness might be different, but we all experience it. And there's some clues about the fruit of the Spirit. So as David wrestled with his sin, with confessing and coming clean before God, look what he said. Let me hear joy and gladness. This was in the midst of his worst trial, his, his most shameful moment. He's crying out, God, let me hear joy in that moment, gladness in that dark time. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out your iniquities. Create me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take down your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. You see, it's not our salvation. A lot of times, actually for a long time, I, I thought that was restoring me the joy of my salvation. It's not. It is my story, but it's his salvation. It's God's salvation that he gives us. 
It's nothing that we do. It's nothing that we can earn. It is a complete, free, unabashed gift of God's uh, great, uh, amazing grace, un unspoken grace to us. Let me restore the joy of your salvation in my heart. Uphold me with the willing spirit. And then it's interesting. Then the fruit of life comes. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Ruth read. Thank you, Ruth. I love your reading of the gospel. And we heard the story here. Rejoice with me. When we lose something, we know, yes, I found it. I, I lost my, my engagement ring. I lost my pearl necklace. I lost my credit card. I lost my glasses. We understand that moment of joy, right? Moments of joy comes when we have an unexpected gift, an unexpected grace that really, really helps us. That's kind of life experience joy. And we understand it. He, Jesus even points to this parallel of, hey, we know the joy of finding something that we lost. Verse 7, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. God says the value of human, finding a human, finding salvation in a human life is immeasurably more wonderful than anything that we could find on this earth. Jesus goes on. Again, talking about friends and neighbors. Rejoice with me. I found my sheep. I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. So here we have a farmer, right? We have a businessman, a businesswoman. Hey, when business deals go the right way, when the stock market goes up, it's easy to have a lot of joy. When it crashes, ugh, not so easy, right? That's what happened here. He lost his sheep, now it was found. His accounts got straightened out. His, his sheep, yeah, joy. But it's nothing in comparison to that one in, in, who repents. And finally, once again, rejoice with me, Jesus says, I found the coin. Therefore, joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I experienced seeing this boy's joy. And what I learned as I had the privilege of going to different mission fields, this was in India, was just seeing this bubbling up joy. Here, we've heard of Agape Orphanage. They have their dinner in a couple weeks. I know if you've been connected to Agape, I know Elaine Brigham was connected to here and so forth. I'm actually still on the board with Agape. Love for you to join me at that dinner in a few weeks. But when you go overseas and you see these kids who live in an orphanage who should be crying, like destitute, who should be sad, like, who cares for me? Who thinks of me? Who knows my name? And yet you meet them, and they're bursting with joy? It, it just does something to your heart. It just, we understand, you need to understand God's valuation of what he's done for us, of what he's done for other people, and we need to understand God's valuation of how much love he puts in the hearts of people. Here, this was in Haiti. Once again, Haiti, similar situation. We hear about the earthquakes. You hear about the rubble. I was in Haiti a few years ago, and this was like over five years after the last earthquake. The rubble is still there. You're like, haven't they cleaned it up? No, they have not cleaned it up yet because they know it's going to come again uh, next month or next year. It rubble everywhere, and yet the kids, the, the joy that they have, undoes, it just undoes your heart. Here was in India, you can see my daughter, two of us went over, she helped teach the kids, we did a little ministry time together teaching the kids as they went to the dental clinic, and that kind of joy, they feel the love of God. And it, 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 it meant so much to me when you experience these kids who have little to nothing, like in comparison, what our kids have, what the people in our system, what we have, the comparison of what we have in our hand is incomparable, and yet their joy is so authentic and palpable and contagious. It's just one of the most beautiful gifts. There's an author named David Kinneman. He wrote the book, You Lost Me, and he was a youth pastor who did research, why are the young people leaving the church? 
And he, he figures out these clear reasons. And I've preached that sermon series in another church. Maybe we'll, we'll do it here. Very interesting. One of them is teens are missional. And if our church is not missional and we don't connect teens to missions, they're like, you're just playing church games. You've got to be involved. And so what I saw with this is I read a quote that David Kinnaman said, teens who are second generation Christians who've grown up in the Christian home and gone through the Christian church and all that stuff, they typically face two roads. They either crash and burn, and if they have some cataclysmic life experience, it wakes them up and they're like, oh, okay, maybe I need God's help. Or they'll have some life-changing mission experience where their heart just grows. And then and their life perspective is turned upside down and they realize maybe, maybe it's not just all about me. They live under the mom and dad's grace. They live under that Christian grace and they don't realize for themselves what a huge gift that is. And so what we need to understand is God's valuation of things. Corinthians says this, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. I like how the Message Bible puts it. Once again, this is more of a commentary, but I, I, I like the phrase. We're not understand putting ourselves in a league with those who boast that they're our superiors. Paul was facing criticism. He says, we wouldn't dare do that. But in all this comparing and grading and competing, they quite missed the point. And he's saying, hey, stop comparing yourselves. Understand God's valuation. Stop looking to the left and the right. I have the privilege of teaching at Northeastern on some Thursday nights. And we do a certain project where students choose a, a, a speech topic and they teach us about leadership and communication. And I had a girl from India, a student from India, who decided to do her speech about her Instagram experience. She was a model in India and she was using Instagram to build her brand. And she said she became so anxious, so overwhelmed, so depressed because she was continually checking the likes, checking the clicks. She became obsessed with every post. How do people like my post? How do people like my face? How do people like my clothes? And it just overwhelmed her and she had to shut it down. We can live by comparing ourselves and we'll be caught in the dungeon of discouragement. Or we can live understanding God's valuation, and then we can live in freedom. That's what Paul's saying here. The second thing, we can be declarative and intentional. This one is perhaps most important. We love this, Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. We read all those Psalms. The word rejoice, joy, and joyful appears 430 times according to this Bible teacher, Naveen Ritchie. She went through a study. How many times does this come up? Did you hear that? 430 times. That's a few more times than it tells us to read our Bibles. That's more times than it tells us to go to church. That's even more times than it tells us to give an offering. It says, no, rejoice is the number one thing that we should do as a Christian. Years ago, I actually did a Bible study, and I looked at all the verbs, looking at joy, looking at bless the Lord. I looked at the verses of the poor. There's about, there's about 500 verses that talk about serving the poor. It blew my mind, and it changed my heart of how we need to be engaged with the poor. But if you look at all the verses about rejoicing and praising, it's over a thousand. As Christians, we need to be engaged in praise and rejoicing more than anything. We know that verse in Thessalonians. I love this one. Rejoice always, all the time. Now, that's just not when the sun is shining. That's rejoice always. Always, we've got to be intentional to rejoice always. We've got to be declarative to rejoice always. And then the other things he adds, which I love, pray without ceasing. You know, those go hand in hand. We should be rejoicing and praying. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God 
in Christ Jesus for you. You know, people ask, what's, what's God's will for my life? I'll tell you, rejoice. Pray. Rejoice some more. Give thanks. It's pretty simple. Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, I told you, we'd circle this back to that verse in Galatians. The reason why that verse in Galatians seemed difficult, had no connection, here, this verse, Philippians 4, Paul wrote this when he was in jail. That's when he's saying, rejoice in the Lord always, not just when you're out of jail, when you're in the jail of life, the jail of finances, the jail of relationship, the, the jail of discouraged and depressed emotions, the jail of anxiety, rejoice. We all face fear and imprisonment in our minds, in our situation. Paul says rejoice. Now let's look at Galatians 5 once again. This is the same chapter where he's going to tell us the fruit of the Spirit. So this isn't just a pretty little plaque. You know, this is why I'm not a big fan of hanging Bible verses in the house. They look like a, you know, nice uh, cookie, like a... Uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, fortune cookie, sorry, <laughs> a fortune cookie. The Bible is not a bunch of fortune cookie verses. There's context, right? So when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, he, this is the context. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? These people were in great conflict. Galatians was being torn apart. That whole context was they were in tension. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You know why he's saying leaven? Meaning, there's a few false teachers going around. There's a few gossipers. There's a few backbiters. There's a few people who are mad at the church. Now, I hope you're not going to get mad at me. Hope when you leave today, you don't be like, whoop, are those guitars in church? Guitars? They better not bring in the drums, too. Listen, please. It's okay. We're all worshiping together, right? We can rejoice with the Lord, even if it's not our favorite type of, of mode in music. We want to make the church open to, to all new people, right? This is what this is all about. They faced church struggle too. They faced backbiters and gossipers and people hurting the church leadership. Paul said, the one who is troubling you, these were teachers who were attacking Paul says, why am I still being persecuted? Paul himself was being totally undermined and persecuted. And in the midst of that, he said the fruit of the Spirit. The same, just a few verses before the fruit of the Spirit. We need to understand that we have to be declarative and intentional. That's when he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And then a few verses later, that song that we just sang, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul brings this all together in the midst of prison. Joy is an act of intentionality. It's not just going to happen because we wake up happy. It's going to happen because we say, God's will for my life, for this is the will of God, to rejoice. This is the will of God, to praise. When we start doing that, it'll become more and more natural. But we need to begin with an intentionality. I enjoy some of the sermons from Joyce Meyer. Now, some people, they don't like Joyce Meyer. That's okay. I grew up in a church where they would criticize every other preacher. They would criticize every other church. They would criticize every other person on the radio. I don't do that. You know why? Because Paul himself says in that book of Philippians, don't be criticizing other people if they're preaching Christ. I'll tell you one thing that I do like about Joyce Meyer. She was a woman who was abused, who faced a lot of sexual abuse, and her life was undone. She was just... Un had no purpose, was spiraling down in depression and anxiety. And then she got a hold of God's valuation for her life, and it changed her attitude. And one of her favorite quotes that I love is, you can have pity or you can have power. And what she's saying is, in my life, I faced abuse, and I had to make a choice. I could continue to wallow in the pity of my abuse, or I could say, by the grace of God, 
That is dealt with. It's under the blood. And I'm going to move forward with God's plan in my life. Amen. And that's when we get power. But it's being intentional. And that's what I love about Joyce's testimony. Whether we like every sermon she preaches, I'm not up here to say buy every sermon of hers, but I do love her life story. The battlefield of the mind she talks about because we've got to be intentional and declarative when it comes to rejoicing. And then finally, we need to accept the process of joy. Now here, this was on Super Bowl Sunday. This is when the Patriots won. I don't know if you could tell, I was happy here. I was with my dad, and we're cheering and rejoicing. Now the problem is, if you've been part of New England, you know that we didn't always win every single Super Bowl. Now we're back in those uh, days where we might not win this year. But, you know, those moments of joy are real, and the, the smiles are big, and the cheering is loud. But you can't do that every day. You don't win the Super Bowl every day. Here, the Bruins, once again, with Dad, cheering when the Bruins won the cup. Yes, Lord, thank you, thank you. Am I allowed to say thank you, Lord, for that? I don't know. But there's a lot of joy in those moments. Taking my daughter to go see the next Star Wars. It hadn't, you know, that new one hadn't come out for years. A lot of joy in that new Star Wars. Finally, we went to the drive-in. Or at the end of a hike. When I was hiking, oh, nope, not there yet. This verse in James 1. Count it all joy. It's a process. It doesn't just happen in one day, right? He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Joy comes as a process. It's both understanding God's valuation, it's also declarative and intentional, and it's also a process. It comes at the end of a lot of hard work. We're all cheering at the Patriots Super Bowl, but they put in all the work every day. They put in the sweat and the grind. P uh, James here, he says, hey, those trials, that's gonna build character. That's gonna build fruit, that spiritual fruit that we want. That comes through trials. So he says, count it joy that you have these trials. Understand that that's going to produce steadfastness, and, and finally you will be mature. There's my hiking photo. This was at the end. You know, I'm a slow hiker. I am so slow. I was hiking this week. I, I put in a bunch of miles up in New Hampshire. I try to catch some fall foliage. I'm doing the Appalachian Trail, so I, I put in some miles. And as I was hiking up this mountain, feeling pretty good, uh, feeling pretty good, I looked behind me. Is that Paul and Desi? Who is that behind me? It was two folks who were about 20 years, a little bit older. They were crushing me. I was hiking as fast as they could, and they were gaining on me and gaining on me and gaining on me. Look, I'm not a fast hiker. I'm a slow hiker, but I commit to the process. I commit to the pain. I can tell you that when I hike those miles, once you get up to mile 10 and mile 20 and mile 30 and mile 40, and I did 53 miles the last couple of days, every single bone in your body is hurting, every one. But then there's joy at the end of it because it's like, yes, there's the summit. There's the beauty. That's that gorgeous sunset that is so hard to capture anywhere. Joy is a process. We need to understand God's valuation. We need to understand that we have to be intentional, but there's a process. And our Savior, Jesus, he walked the road of Calvary, and he saw joy in that. Therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin, which so which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know, this is one of my favorite verses. I've read it a few times. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus looked at the joy. He understood it was a process. 
the not my will but yours be done, oh God, was part of the process to bring the joy. Family of God, God's joy is ours. We need to be intentional. We need to feel his love. We need to set our eyes and understand his love. But we also need to commit to the process like our Lord Jesus. Let's all bow in prayer.